Greetings, folks. Greetings, greetings. As we said in the 60s, power to the people. <laughs> and unbeknownst to the people, we still have the power, we just don't use it. There is so much to be told about what happened back in the 60s and the 70s that I don't know if it will ever come to the forefront. I mean, there's so many intricate details involved in uh, COINTELPRO that uh, we do know and we don't know. I mean, all the internal strife that uh, members of the uh, revolutionary parties had to deal with, um, a lot of people don't understand that, don't know that, don't know the uh, kinds of internal battles that we had between us as uh, members of revolutionary organizations. There was a very solid group in the Midwest uh, between Kansas City, Omaha, Des Moines. And um, we had issues with the uh, West Coast leadership. And the West Coast leadership actually sent people up here to take us out, who ended up joining us. <laughs> because we disagreed with so much that was going on internally. Like what, one thing that I think we've got to keep in mind is that we were a very young organization. We never really had a chance to grow, and we tried to do too many things under, under one uh, auspices. And trying to be the military, trying to be the, polit the political arm became very difficult. We dressed in military dress, so we were easy to identify by the police. Uh, we were easy to attack. Things that we hadn't really thought through, but still, we made an impact. And I doubt that uh, those who weren't involved can understand the strength between the Panther Party and the community. And I have apologized for coming here late. I forgot all about it, because I thought it was next week. And then, uh, as Tariq said, I used the old man's excuse, the old man's brain, and got a lot of stuff floating around, and sometimes it gets bumped out of the way, and sometimes it gets confused with other things. So just bear with me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I wish I had a magic wand to get my brothers uh, Mondo and Ed out of the penitentiary. Uh, we know what a sham that was. Uh, and I give you a little background on how the FBI, and, and I can't tell you the difference between the FBI and the CIA. They were probably one and the same at the time. I married um, a black female. Ed and I had went to uh, Beatrice, Nebraska for a Black Artist Festival. And uh, during a Peace and Freedom rally, at the same time, I met my wife's boyfriend, who she was very angry with. And he told me, he said, well, you know they're having a Black Arts Festival out at the campus, so you should go out there. Well, her being angry with him and him being angry in Lincoln at the uh, Peace and Freedom Rally, leaving her behind, left her vulnerable. So, unfortunately for him, and fortunately for me, we met. And uh, we met in, I think it was April. She came to Omaha in June on her way to uh, her brother's wedding. She was from Pennsylvania. And consequently, uh, she stayed over here in Omaha, and we got married about a month after that. And that was 41 years ago, so there is true love at first sight. <laughs> but her family, um, my, I came from a working class family. Her family was one that has a long history of uh, following Judaism. Her great-great-grandfather, who was a runaway slave, started their religion. Church of God, Saints of Christ, Temple Bethel. And uh, they have temples all over the world. They, in fact, in Virginia, they have a hospital, uh, hotel, uh, 
elderly uh, home and very re uh, ethnic resources for the community. So it's primarily a black uh, religion, but there's a uh, segment of it that is white. And I don't know if that'll ever be resolved, but uh, they are kind of one and the same and then they're different. But anyway, when, when we got together, uh, her mother panicked because all of the you know misinformation that was put out by the media and FBI regarding who the Panthers were and what they were about. So her mother was a staunch Republican and she was a school teacher. So needless to say, she wasn't that happy with her daughter. But her mother and I became the best of friends and uh, she was just as revolutionary as the rest of us. She, um, she went through a lot of changes as did her son-in-law. Her son-in-law was a principal of a school in Jersey. And the FBI went to the school and talked to the administration of the school and told them lots of lies about her brother-in-law, trying to get him fired. Now, and I don't know if it was discussed earlier or not, but one of the ways the FBI works is they don't directly attack people. They go around their friends, their relatives, and tell lies and get them hyped up and create internal strife amongst the families. And consequently, uh, the family structure breaks down because uh, if you are considered to be related to that group of people, then that you're considered uh, the enemy of the FBI in the country and what have you. So they caught hell. But you know, the will of the people is strong, and they did not let that divert their love for me, their daughter, and the fact that they had a great grandfather who was a runaway slave, who started their religion and followed the uh, Jewish calendar. And they were very strong, and they would not let that affect them. And they did not turn against me or any of my comrades. They came to uh, Philadelphia uh, to meet with me. Because what we did is uh, we took a lot of propaganda that we had. And uh, we used my brother-in-law's car, who was the principal. And there, were, there was a lot of misinformation about how we were up and down the coast distributing all this information to uh, organize against the country and the government and what have you. Can I get some water? So, um, fortunately what that did for us, it brought us all closer together. And unfortunately when I look at it at this day and time, we're in much worse shape today than we were back then. We have, um, we have been politicized and a lot of that politicizing we have taken and thrown in the garbage can and allowed the right wing uh, of this country and this government to change the laws. Uh, what we used to consider and we complained about not having freedom, we had so many more freedoms than we do today and that's our fault. That's because we allowed this, uh, we allowed people to be voted in who were right wingers. We allowed criminals to be voted in, and they began to change the law little by little by little. And the things that we took for granted back then, we don't have anymore. And I don't know how well you keep up with the changes in the legislation what's allowed to be passed these days. But those were the things that we fought against back in the 60s and 70s so that they would not materialize today. But we have been really co-opted and we just don't grasp what is going on. They sugarcoat everything and we fall for it. We believe that, you know, in, in this society that the gangs of the criminals who are recruited by the FBI and CIA and 
they become pawns and they don't, a lot of them don't understand. I won't say they all don't, but a lot of them don't understand. And a lot of them, um, a lot of them are um, politicized. I know uh, in Chicago there was a lot of political activities uh, back in the uh, 90s and 80s working with older gang members uh, to politicize them, to get them involved in the uh, political stream. Now, I, uh, I don't have first-hand information. My information is second-hand by the comrades that I ran with who came here from Chicago who had those relationships. And they really began to politicize gang members, raising their level of consciousness trying to get them out of that uh, street mentality and into a political mentality. And some of that has really worked. Um, and as, as that began to grow, you can see how the FBI and local law enforcement reacted to that. Because you can see what happened to Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. And, you know, all, we have to remember that what what the enemy tells you is the, in the enemy's best interest and not in yours. So we have a tendency to believe that when they speak, they're speaking to protect us. And that's a lie. Whatever they say, it's a lie. If they show you that it's not, it's still a lie. So, you know, we have gotten to the point where we don't even know who the enemy is. We, and it's a very subtle and different kind of revolution or counter-revolution that they're into today because they've got so many of their uh, lackeys, dogs, in the political government, in political power. And it's not the same kind of uh, people that they were putting in the government back in the 60s and 70s. These are a different kind of people who look like they're in all our best interests and they really uh, support the criminal element, but they let us know that they're there to defend us against that criminal element. So, you know, we get caught in a catch-22. And anymore, uh, we, we hear about uh, in other countries how people get arrested for, um, for participating in, in rallies and protests, but the same thing goes on here. You know, they did their training here, and then they went to other countries, and they uh, perpetrated those same kinds of mentalities and activities in those countries. So, and we know through the history of what has happened with the FBI and the CIA and the fascists of this country is that they have become the quasi-heroes, and we have all become the enemy. You can't speak out. They, you know, the media says, oh, we're in a free nation, you can say this, you can say that. But what do you see in the news media, is that true? If we went out and, and if we peaceably, peaceably protested against the laws that are being passed, we would be ran in jail, we would be beat, just like in other countries. So we know that the training those folks got came from this country. Excuse me, my, I get dry when I talk too much. But anyway, okay, I, I just want to say, um, it is so important for us really to stay organized and not do these on a one-shot basis, but for us to get together and do some critical analysis. And one of the things that, and I'm not sure if you pay attention to it or not, critical analysis is not taught in our schools today from the kindergarten through college. It's the sound bite. You know, you don't discuss it, you don't look for a foundation for it, just 
you know, believe what I say. And it's only a piece of the whole discussion that they respond to, and that's the sound bite. You ask, well, what about all this other information around the sound bite that contradicts what you said? You never hear about that. We only hear that little piece. And you got to remember, this is the way that our children are being taught today. So if we don't do some home training with them once they get out of school and come home, they're lost. And they're going to think they're doing the right thing while they're undermining everything that has transpired before them. So Tariq uh, said that I had a need to ask you to ask me some questions. Anything. Talk about the, since we're here talking about Mondo Ned, talk about what it was like for you as an observer of the trial and, and you know, what you saw happen. Mm. Once again, uh, a lot of the activity for uh, the trial was not necessarily at the trial, but it was in the streets and was propagated by the FBI or COINTELPRO to turn the people against um, Dave and Ed and to distort the movement and the stories so that uh, they were guilty before they even went to trial. The news media played an important role in that, as they always have. I know that uh, I read stories in the World Herald of activities I had been involved in, and when I read the stories, I said, well, when did that happen? I was right there, I didn't see that, you know? So, they made up the stuff, and if you read the COINTEL stuff, they'll tell you that we did that with the media, and, and we put in all these, uh, I guess, counterintelligence kinds of activities to undermine the organization. Uh, during the trial, there was, I think, a lot of people were afraid to come to the forefront because they feared the repercussions of that. I mean, were they going to lose their job? Were they going to uh, be ostracized from the community? Because they talked in support of Ed and Dave. Uh, a, a lot of uh, that undermining was intimidation within the community. And so people, when they want to testify, they may not have testified as strong as they would like to have because of the repercussions of that. So, you know, your heart is in one place, but your family's over here, what you have to do in the community is over here, and it's so hard to mix those. You know that what's happening is wrong, but where is your protection to speak about what is right? And as I said before, we were young in our organizing. And we didn't understand the full extent of what it meant to organize. Who, who all need to be protected to be allowed to do what they need to do. And I think an example of how that works is, you look at what the FBI does when it gets its uh, witnesses on the witness stand and then they, they hide them, they protect them, you know, they allow them to speak against the people that they work for or that they partnered with, but we didn't have that opportunity. We had nobody but ourselves. And so every time we spoke, it was a risk, and every time a community person spoke, it was a risk. So consequently, you know, people were at great risk, and, and you have to give them a lot of credit for taking that stance in support of uh, Mondo and Ed. The, um, I wasn't involved a whole lot in the trial. They, they brought us in to testify, and then we weren't necessarily in the courtroom after that. Um, we, we did what we could, um, we rallied where we could, but once again, we were, we were newborns, we were youngsters, adolescents. We weren't, we weren't that organized and we didn't understand how the whole system worked and how we could protect ourselves and who we could turn to. And
consequently today it's even worse because we allowed all these new bills to be passed, new laws, and they're very fascist laws, and they take away the rights of the people. At any time, did y'all um, try to determine who might the informants be that um, were part of the organization? Or did that stop being important enough to be arrested? Well, I think that, uh, Tariq, you have to understand that when we talk about the Panther Party in Omaha per se, there were many, many people who considered themselves to be Panthers. <coughs> Some were thugs, some were just uh, people who wanted to hide, and they were not necessarily politicized. So a lot of people that people thought were Panthers were not Panthers. And contrary to uh, the opinion that Panthers were just uh, warriors, aggressive, violent, we had, we had to pack, take tests, we had to be educated, we had to move from one level to another. We were, if you didn't know uh, the points of the party, you'd be kicked out. So those people that you found around who were doing all the hype were not necessarily members of the party, they were just wannabes. And so that consequently lots of conflicts came about because of that. A lot of people uh, of goodwill uh, stood up, but then as uh, Tariq was asking about those, those people who were subversive to us, it was hard to identify. Everything was kind of chaotic during that time. Uh, later years we found out who were actually uh, working for the FBI and the police. And when you say working for them, it's not necessarily that you get a check. It's not that you um, identify yourself with a badge or a paper or something. It's what you say. It's supporting that co-intel process. And you get indoctrinated into it, and you actually become the enemy of the revolution because the propaganda that you're spreading is anti-revolutionary and consequently there were many problems. People of goodwill didn't know, you know. There, there were some real, um, there were some real undercover people and some of those came to the top in later years, but during that time we didn't know. Or I'm sure there would have been some political activity in relation <laughs> Well, in some places it did happen, happen, but for the most part, people didn't know. We we were not that organized. We were young, you know. Yes. Um, when this coming up, the story that we used to hear about is about um, um, Gwen Peaks, who was supposed to be the one who uh, supposedly uh, did the bombing of Alpha of Larry Menard that framed the uh, airport, airport next year. Um, when the police did the investigation and uh, interrogated Peaks at that time, um, what happened was, during the recess, he came back with glasses and everything, um, and they found out that he was beaten up and stuff like that. Uh, was there any type of investigation during that time, and has anybody ever tried to get See, the main case would be is to find Dwayne Pink. He's the one that points the finger to Ed, Ed and Rice. He's the one that said that they did it after he was uh, worked over by the, uh, the police and uh, precinct and stuff like that. Propaganda is a powerful thing. So I, I don't know if you know much about the Peak family. I'm a Peak. I'm one of the elder Peaks now. Okay. I've lived that long. <laughs> but um, Dwayne's grandfather on his mother's side was a minister. And he was a good person. But the, and, and I, I'm only giving you information that I've heard. I have no direct information. 
but that uh, they met with uh, Dwayne's father and grandfather and worked out a deal because, you know, Dwayne never went to trial and uh, got him to uh, co-op a lot of the uh, stories that were going on and I don't know because they took Dwayne to uh, Fremont, you know, and that's where they incarcerated him and held him during the trial, before the trial. So we don't actually know what happened to him there. And as the brother said, um, he started out telling one story at the trial, and at the end of the trial he was telling a totally different story. And he did have the sunglasses on, which uh, we all assumed that he was beat. I didn't see him, but uh, the stories were very credible about his beating and um, he was also drugged. So yeah, he was he was drugged and beat to get him to tell the story that they wanted to tell. And I forget how many times they had him on the stand. Well, that's not the right story. And I guess they recessed. They they went back and they talked to Dwayne some more, physically, mentally what have you, to get him to change his story. So, eventually he told the story that uh, they wanted him to say. Now you got to remember, Dwayne is 15 years old. He's very young. And so, you know, at that age and during that time, it was very easy to intimidate people. And you got a young man like Dwayne who's isolated from his family and have people like the Reverend. And like I said, the Reverend was a good man, but he he didn't have the same political ideology as we had. So consequently, he was a supporter of the system, which did not help his grandson any, but he wanted to help his grandson by telling him, well, go along with the police, do what the police tell you to do. And Consequently, his story changed, and uh, the final story came out as he ended up uh, with a story that uh, was not in the best interest of Ed and Dave. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You didn't say your name right. It's Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I think you. I that's very important because we forget that uh, Brother Stokely started in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and when Huey died, Dr. Huey was in Correct. And then again, you just put the points down. Mm -hmm. Most of the brothers that was in the family were highly educated people that went on to be professors and lawyers and doctors and stuff like that. And so I just want to stand and give you accurate. I want to give whoever to put this together because you said something very important. If you look around the face, you see the young faces they did. If you looked at that tape, you saw the young faces then. And what's happening is that we are now the elders. Like you said, we had nobody. I was in the courtroom when, uh, when they uh, brought uh, Frank, I mean, uh, Wayne to, to the session. I was sitting beside Senator Chambers. And he came in that morning, he said one thing. They stopped the trial, took him back out. He came back the next thing, at, 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 at the evening trial, and if you tell his face was public. Mm -hmm. And he did have on Sunday. But the most important thing you said to me, that we can't just do this today and go and don't do it again for another six months. We've got to do what we did back in the day. We've got to educate the people. We've got to get up in front of them more than just every six months. They get, I think what they're saying now, we are 10-day people. You know what? They come up, they put a pressure on us, and then we disappear the next 10 days, they don't see us for another six months. And the same people that's out there now, because if you read the Mrs. if you read uh, his, uh, I think Quan uh, Ray's book, Are You Ready for the Revolution? He tells you in there about how uh, we got PhDs in Mississippi because they started the Freedom School. We got the same problem going right now. We got the same problem going right now, and the young people want to do something, but they don't have no help. We are not help. If we don't put this event on, I wish you would make this center like at least once a month. To bring you in front of young people so they can hear what you guys say. But it's doctor. 
Thank you, my Thank you. Well, power to the people. <laughs> Whatever your title, I appreciate that, Carl. But, you know, there are many people who were part of the struggle that people may not even know about, like Brother Carl and his constituency. And we had the Black Dojo down on 24th Street. Uh, we, we had so much going on in our community that hasn't been told. We probably need a session just to do a historical piece on what really went on in the community. I can tell you that um, it, it's, it, it's only by the grace of God probably that I'm here today. Because one of the events that occurred um, and, and blessed people because we had people at the phone company who would call us and tell us, your phone's tapped. Don't say anything, you know, the police are coming. So we, we had that kind of support coming from the community the police didn't know. So when we were supposed to be, uh, the, one of the nights we were supposed to be attacked, um, the information came down that the police were going to attack us. And that came through the phone line. So somebody got the phone conversation and passed it on to us at headquarters. So, um, a lot of the headquarters around California had been attacked and everybody was in the headquarters and consequently they either got arrested or shot. But we had a different plan. In our organized neighborhood, uh, and, and people that always talk bad about the Panthers and the community because the community didn't support the Panthers. All our neighbors had their guns and they were up in the windows. We were waiting for the police. I know I was out in the weeds uh, with my carbine, with my uh, 30 round clips, two of them. But, and uh, some of our community leaders and some of our police officers came down to quell that uh, small uh, battle that didn't occur. But anyway, uh, there was some negotiation that went on and, and there were some community leaders who had a lot to lose as, uh, in the eyes of the system. They came forward and they intervened and consequently uh, a lot of people did not die that night who would have died. And I probably would have been one of them. And I know my brother would have been. There was a lot of unity amongst the art community with those people who supported us, uh, those who were close to us. And a lot of that came out of the community work, the breakfast programs. Uh, we had liberation school after regular school. Uh, after public school, the kids would come down to the headquarters. We would feed them uh, places like Montoya's. They would give us food and we would feed the kids. And uh, we we have class discussions and we tell the kids about uh, who Santa Claus really was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and and we really did uh, a lot of work with young people because young people get misled very easily. So we try to straighten out all those myths and uh, we had some very strong young warriors at that time. And like Carl said, you know, we, those are the kinds of things we need to keep uh, doing. You notice in the Jewish community that uh, kids go to public school, but then they go uh, to their, get their religious training, their historical training after public school. And we don't do that, unfortunately. Uh, we wait for the public school system to teach them, and the public school system not going to teach them what we need to teach them. I know when I went to uh, public school, the only thing I learned about was peanuts and, uh, you know, George Washington Carver and the slaves. And they demeaned, they demeaned people of color so that you were really reluctant to bring up this story or the issue because, I mean, you're young, 
uh, your esteem is so important to you. You know, when you hear all this negative stuff, you know, your people were nothing but slaves, and you know, the only people that did anything were like George Washington Carver with the peanuts. I mean, all these, all these American inventions today, you know, the information is starting to surface about there was a black man behind them. So uh, we, did, we didn't have access to that kind of information. So consequently, I got to tell you folks, any black man that's alive today that's doing anything needs to be applauded. Because <laughs> when you look at what we've come through, we, we should be patted on the back, given medals. You know, I'm telling you, holidays need to be labeled after us. <laughs> Look what we came through. We came over here on ships that we didn't book any passage on. You know, it was pre-booked for us, and uh, we got here and we came in chains. We were beat. Uh, we worked cotton fields. We worked in the dirt. Uh, we were not allowed to be educated. And that upsets me about the school system today because they talk about our kids and school system. But uh, at the time when we first got over here, if we wanted to be educated, we would be killed. You couldn't be educated. You had to be yas yes, yes man, uh, no me. I didn't want to do that, and this and that and that. If you talk as they call proper language, you'd be killed or you'd be punished. So, you know, none of that history comes out when they start talking about our aversion to school and, and learning. Because we came up through brutality with education. The native people, when you, what they went through, and probably are still going through with the, with the, with the white man's schools that they put together on the reservation, and, and the students that were raped and beat, so, you know, America is, is, this is my saying, tell me anything, I'm American, you know. Tell me your lies, I'm American, because I believe them. You know, we believe anything. And unfortunately, you know, it, it, the word is not readily accessible to our communities and to our people about the lies and about the truth. And we're always in a dilemma, I think, because we don't know, uh, we don't know which way is up. And much as we try to find it, it's always diverse, di divisive for us in that since we don't have our true documented history and it's, and it's not propagandized by us, then we have a tendency to be in a battle whenever we raise the issue of the truth. I, uh, I wrote a grant to the uh, state of Nebraska to write, to work with kids, and uh, my references were Juwanza Kamjufu and uh, Dr. Uh, Naeem Akbar, and they had nerve enough to write back to me saying, well, your references, we don't know these references. They're not valid. And I said, well, who the hell are you to judge me and my references? You don't know anything about me, my people, or my community. And that's why it's so important that, you know, we have places like the Black Library, that we write our own history, and that we write the truth, and we discuss it. <laughs> Oh, the clock, yes. Tick-tock, tick-tock. <laughs>